Okay, cool. So obviously you heard from Kendall. Um, he, he helps tremendously on the back end with getting stores up and running, especially, you know, the creativity of the offer and just really making sure that the brand has that product market fit, right? And I think one of the biggest things that we have a good dynamic duo with, but also because of the nature of how e-commerce can be so focused on marketing, I wanted to give more perspective on the financial frameworks that we use. So my headline is how we grow and scale e-commerce brands for clients profitably using a financial framework so you're not dependent on a ROAS emotional roller coaster, right? Um, obviously with iOS 14, other things that have happened uh, it can be uh, even misleading with where you should be spending your capital, where you should be actually recycling that, where you should be investing. And so that's really what I want to focus on because over the past few years, uh, most people know me for advertising and marketing. That's where my personal brand kind of lies in the space. And um, as Los was saying earlier, I've had agencies, we've, I've worked with coaches, I've worked with consultants, I've worked with e-commerce brands. Um, I've worked with a lot of different types of offers. I always say I basically have sold everything and anything under the sun except for adult toys and CBD. So I've seen a lot of crazy offers, how people sell them. And, um, but what I actually have is more of a finance background. Uh, I got into cryptocurrency around 2016 um, and actually had a little bit of a hedge fund at the time, which is kind of cool. Uh, but then when I went full-fledged into marketing, I always had that skew of finance. Like how would this look like as an investment or where should the frameworks be established to actually then continue to invest or to pull out, scrap things and, and go from there. So. Here are some of the results. We've worked with a lot of different brands. Kendall had mentioned about scaling a brand from 500K to 5 million. That brand's now on over past 10 million now, I think, over the past two years. Um, we've scaled skincare brands. We've scaled uh, a lot of other consumable brands as well. Um, and really, it's based off of the financial framework of when can they sustain the scale, when can they actually afford the scale. And uh, I've worked with a lot of brands, as I was mentioning, and we just kind of realized that um, they didn't know what they didn't know because of the financials uh, being at certain stages, like where they can safely invest, where they're over investing. Um, and what was really just stressing them out really was typically inventory, uh, any revenue shares if they're working for an advertising agency, how it all pan out at the end of the day. And if there's any other content or media costs that needed to come into helping them actually expand their brand. So uh, what I'm going to cover a little bit more today is just simplicity, give you guys some guardrails and some, uh, uh, some frameworks to use. Now it's not set in stone. Every brand's a little bit different and it bleeds into different areas of your growth. Um, but I think it's just going to help provide a little bit of clarity getting out of the ads manager and just kind of not being stuck in the forest to see the trees. So uh, with that being said, um, there's three types of marketing and this is super simplistic. Uh, Kendall showed you a little bit more top of funnel, middle funnel, bottom funnel. It's just brand performance and direct response, right? And at the end of the day, um, each person uh, that you, you know, work with, it, you have to deploy some of these uh, methods or a combination of the methods depending on where they're at financially. And um, I think that's also something that's gonna work for a brand that's doing you know, multiple seven figures is probably not what's gonna work for someone just starting out because one, they're at two different levels, but uh, there's a lot more data and a lot more financial infrastructure that the company has uh, instead of just uh, you know, copying and ripping and seeing if it works. Um, so the first things first is where can you actually deploy capital right now? It's Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Uh, I will be harping on TikTok a bit more as well because it has been uh, financially more feasible, uh, specifically with you know traffic, with CPMs, and even with some cross-platform remarketing. Um, but just to even pound that into your guys' head even more if you guys aren't on TikTok yet, um, this is actually a study from Common Thread Collective. They're a pretty big advertising agency, uh, but just showing year over year how much uh, the average spend has gone down in Facebook, but how much it's actually costed. So there's an inverse relationship, meaning it's costing more and less people are actually using it. So uh, they're kind of playing with the CPMs there based off some of their scandals that they've had. Um, but this is uh, not new. It's always happened with advertising platforms. At some point, they'll have something that hits and something that doesn't. Uh, but what's really popular right now, obviously, is TikTok. And this style of content particularly has helped, especially with CPMs bringing that cost down. Uh, you heard from some speakers earlier today, some of them have $4 CPMs, uh, while others have 45 on TikTok or even other channels. And the main thing is the format of the content, how it's used, and, and what types of content there are. So from a UGC perspective, um, Dan obviously spoke about that earlier. I've worked with him. He's been phenomenal. This is actually an example of one of the content pieces that he produced for us. Um, but I kind of categorize them personally into pure UGC versus edited. Um, pure UGC is where you're having the content creator actually create it how they want to and how they actually feel comfortable doing so. So working with an influencer in this space, it was actually the cryptocurrency niche. 
they are already a mini authority or a niche authority in the space. They have a style, they get it, they understand, just let them do their thing. That's what I would consider a little bit more of the pure UGC because it's not scripted, there's no random hooks or anything, but they do understand the objective based off of the brief that we give them. So it's a little bit more native and it actually feels organic when it comes off on their feed, when they post it, and then when we use it in Spark ads, it actually uh, just has a little bit more lift on that as well, which is really cool. And then I like the edited UGC, uh, and this campaign uh, was very, very particular with how we ran it, and I'll cover that uh, a bit more. Um, but we not only picked a persona and who we were gonna go for, but we basically went after a certain demographic and just covered uh, through many different influencers, many different hooks, many different angles, and the elements that we used were the actual raw content itself, uh, the actual um, brand, as you can see, some renders of some of the brand and the product and things there, but really title cards to help make it more conversational. And the reason why the edited UGC had worked really well is because that style, if you guys have ran Facebook ads uh, in the past, also uh, it kind of trans, uh, it, that format specifically with title cards making it uh, uh, follow a train of thought works on Facebook well. And so that's the way that we've introduced it to uh, TikTok. Um, and vice versa, it works for both. It obviously has a little bit more of an advantage with Facebook, but it's still the same format and you can test to see what works. Um, but that worked extremely well for us and niching down on the audience and the persona type really helped us with that as well. And that's just to make the, the front end acquisition a bit, more, um, a bit more efficient, I should say. Now, I know some people are here, they have bigger brands, they're already scaling and they're doing some, some phenomenal numbers and some people are here just starting out, don't even really know what e-commerce is or you know, trying to make it as efficiently as possible to, to go through the process. And so this method has one asterisk around it. That asterisk is if you're doing drop shipping, this is a typical model that people will follow. Um, and then if you're a brand, you're probably entering anywhere between here and above. Um, so what, what we like to do personally here at Automated Retail Commerce is start out with drop shipping and validating the offer first because it sucks and I've heard nightmare stories where people are forking out hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars in brand inventory content and they haven't even gotten their first customer. And it, it's crazy to me that people do that and that that's some, somewhere someone is teaching that and I don't, I don't agree with it at all because you know I didn't come from you know, a lot of money or anything. So I was always, you know, trying to make it super efficient and media buying can be an expensive sport. E-commerce can be an expensive sport and you're just buying digital stuff. You don't even know what you're doing in the beginning. So um, this framework kind of allowed me to not only diagnose brands where they were at with marketing strategy, but also help where the entrepreneur, where they were at to help them. And then you just kind of bridge them through where they need to invest their money or their time and stuff. So again, really that zero, whoops, that zero to 30K uh, per month offer is validating it, uh, validating the product market fit, uh, validating the content, um, really understanding the unit economics. Kendall earlier was talking about what advantages can you do to the actual offer or the pricing itself, and that's where you want to start testing that. Will it work at 60 bucks, or will it work at 50 or 40, or really what is it that you're gonna offer, and if you're going to try and bank your profit on the front end, then how is that gonna work? And you can just use a simple Excel sheet, multiply it by like 100 orders or 3,000 orders, how many you're actually gonna to need to be profitable. And then lastly on that side is the minimum order quantity. So some people want to go straight into, I wanna sell gummies or I wanna sell you know, other products that actually have a lot longer of a logistics leeway than people think. And so, for example, gummies, it may take a while and the minimum order quantities are extremely large. And if you're just starting out without proving out the offer, or validating it, it's probably not the best way for you to get started um, in e-commerce just because there's already a barrier to entry outside of marketing, outside of other things that are already gonna cost uh, with just distribution. So um, that's why we start off with drop shipping. Don't reinvent the wheel first, find out what's working and then, then you can transcend creating a brand. And if you guys have any questions as I go through this, just let me know. But the second tier is typically that 30 to 80K per month. Now on that zero to 30K, you're validating through one or two traffic channels, which are whether it's TikTok and Facebook or Facebook, Instagram, same thing. Um, and then once you get to that thousand dollar a day in revenue price point or a revenue point, the secret is that it's actually pretty easy to get to $90,000 a month, just going, you know, based off of what's already working. But then that's when you really want to squeeze the juice out of the ads and the money that you're paying. So systems for email and SMS marketing, uh, you wanna start then investing into content because if you're operating at about a 20% margin on this, you'll have enough in order to forward invest into some better quality content. Especially if you're drop shipping, you wanna make it custom and start building a moat around what you're doing. Then you wanna look at packaging, 
three PLs and then what would you need or start having those talks with your bankers or with other people to start developing more of a capital line relationship. Um, because if you are planning and you can actually hit these other levels, you want to start building that relationship at the beginning and our banker has been phenomenal in doing so. There's other companies like ClearCo as well that you just sync up with your Shopify store and they'll be able to issue you guys stuff after about, I think, 20 or 30 grand in revenue. So those are also great people to work with if you can, again, when it first starts out with your unit economics and the finances around that, you can see if you can actually afford working with a six, eight, or maybe even 10% interest rate, depending on where you're working at. So um, that's really where we see uh, people typically land not only when they work with us, but typically where they figure out what they don't know that they don't know. And the big other thing that this isn't factoring in is an anomaly where TikTok goes viral and it just completely explodes the business, right? This is if you're just focusing on D to C marketing, ads, content, and you're just going through that grind. So uh, when you're at the, yeah. Yeah, so that conversation's a little bit different. Are you apparel or are you like consumable? Bunch of different products. Uh, we have multiple supply chains, Mexico, China, so yeah. Yeah, so it's gonna vary obviously a little bit when <laughs> Wow, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I mean it just depends. I think if you have a consumable you can have that leeway. Because when you get up to these levels here, um, in each one of these brackets, the game does change um, with your thinking of how you want to start thinking of your revenues and your investments and stuff like that. So if you know that a certain consumable, like gummies as an example, because I brought it up earlier, that you are just going to go full, you know, fully forced into that with influencer campaigns and you're already deploying media and expenses to that, then you should order inventory ahead of time. We did the same thing with the skincare brand. Um, they went from 1 million to 4.2 within 10 months working with us as just an advertising agency. We we're working with back in the day. And we had to stop twice because they didn't order enough. Um, and so it is, it is hard to balance that out, but I do think that if you already know what you're gonna wanna deploy with your ad budget and then what your current return is, whether it's 2.2 to 3.5, then you can project again your, your MOQs and the unit economics with it. And then how much profit are you gonna to need to get to the next leap and the next leap and the next leap. Um, and then sometimes you, know, you do have to go a little bit more, all, like a little bit further, to pay a little bit more in order to uh, uh, get more inventory to help float depending on if you're quarterly planning or doing six month planning. So, um, so 30 to 80K, that's where you really wanna to start to invest into uh, or start the investment process into more production quality content because as soon as you get to 80K to 250K per month, as she was just mentioning, you have inventory, you have to start thinking of your lead times, you actually have to start cranking, and you, it, it's, the, it's the hardest to go from a 250K per month business back down to a 60K, because you already have so much infrastructure built in, and hopefully the team isn't too, you know, you don't go belly up just based off of the team, but you do want to sustain the growth, and uh, we've heard from other speakers earlier how to, you know, extend the life of the creative and stuff like that. It's all very, very important, because once you get to these levels, um, it, you're playing in the bigger leagues when it comes to e-commerce because then your brand can actually sell and you can actually do other things um, and other brands then start to raise capital and uh, that's something that we've actually been interested in doing uh, not only for ourselves but we've seen our competitors for the brands that we manage under our portfolio that get to this point start to do as well and so it does become a different game with those levels of scale and so that's why these jumps, like these brackets, they are a little bit gray. You'll start seeing in the middle of these brackets, you are probably the most profitable. Then as you're squeezing into the next one, you sacrifice profit for growth, and then you continue to do the same thing over and over. So sweet spots in here are like thir uh, anywhere between 40 to about 65. Uh, sweet spots in here are ranging between like 110 to about 220. That's where you kind of see those, those good profits, and then it does start to squeeze or cram down outside of any other uh, anomalies with Facebook, like an account getting shut down or something. Um, so when we hit this level of 80 to 250K, again, more professional content, and someone earlier was asking about Amazon, um, that's when we're moving enough inventory and we're already doing uh, purchases for products. So that's when it makes sense to reroute that into something like Amazon and we're going omni-channel already if it doesn't damage the brand. If it damages the brand and it makes it look cheap or anything like that, we do want to have our own moat associated with it. 
but a little trick that we are actually doing with one of our brands. Uh, it does have a higher premium price point, but we're just using the same supplier, making a knockoff and putting it on Amazon, so we at least capture the revenue both ways. Um, so it doesn't damage your brand, and you're still getting some movement through that uh, fulfillment channel. But that's where you have to do media planning. And so as I was talking about earlier, you're paying influencers, you're paying content creators, you already know how many outputs you're gonna have at that point for certain deliverables, and so it's really important to start thinking um, of how much are you gonna pay for distribution through traditional media, how much are you gonna pay through Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and go hard on those channels, and even how you're going to have other collaborations, what other outlets are you gonna have for PR, or things that make the brand credible. Now some people, again, when they invest into brands, they'll start playing at this level right out the gate because they're backed by capital. Maybe they raised capital or they maybe had a couple hundred thousand dollars, maybe even a you know, million dollars to throw into something, which is cool, but this is typically the most efficient way to do it because you can rinse and repeat the capital and just recycle it instead of having to feel that uh, you have a, you know, a bunch of capital sitting over your shoulders and an investor wanting his money back or her money back. So then capital lines for next level at scale, and that's why I was saying that these relationships with your bankers or just whoever you're working with that's financing uh, the business, super important. Uh, you just have a good relationship. Even if it's self-financed, you still want to have a good relationship with your local banker uh, because if you communicate at these level of stages and they see you grow, they start to treat you differently, I'll say that. But two, they also um, understand where you're going. And if you even just show them like your expansion plans with stuff like this with the framework, they'll have more confidence in you and they'll be way more lenient to extend lines of credit or even pull other things for you, which is also something we've discovered as well. Now, when you get to about 250 to 500K per month, as you make that leap, um, we were talking earlier about lifetime value. That's all important here. But if you've been running your business for, let's say, six months to a year, you've probably then to start hit any one of these top you know, pieces of the, 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 the lever here. But this is where typically your lifetime value will become more and more profitable because sometimes it's a three months, sometimes it's a six month LTV, depending on what the product is. If it was the skincare brand that I was mentioning earlier, that's probably every 60 days, 45, 60 days. And so after you do two or three orders, maybe the ROAS then looks like it's four or seven um, instead of it just being you know one to one or just breaking even. So that's where we start to see a lot of the levers with lifetime value really matter. Like it, they matter so much because it may, it may not matter at these levels because you're just playing an arbitrage game, trying to get the traffic and trying to get the purchases and the inventory to move but it really matters here. And so that's part of your media planning and part of your expansion planning is figuring out what other levels are you gonna pull. And the app that Kendall was talking about earlier is called Disco, uh, where you can actually cross sell other brands on your thank you page. Uh, it's like Disco Network or something like that. Um, so if you wanted to cross collaborate with another D2C brand, it's all there and those are brands that do big volume. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's based off of obviously the EBITDA of the business, but then in the particular company that we're talking about, their company just, uh, the, the company that we're competing against, there's two people in the space, they just raised 40 million uh, for their company. That's an exact competitor to what we're doing. So in an event like that, we already have a whole expansionary document and plans of what we want to do, and it's not even just competing in U.S. markets. It's how do we attack other markets like Australia, Europe, and U.S. So that's where, if we're going to go head to head with 40 million, may not make sense, we may want to differentiate, and so that's, that's typically a private conversation with how much we are potentially looking to raise, but the valuations of those uh, e-commerce brands can be in between three to six EBITDA, um, and so when working with Los, you know, he's helping us work and establish a lot more of the foundations of that EBITDA security. So what I mean by that is, hey, are we going to be on Amazon and have an additional channel if we invested 15, 20 grand into getting that set up? What is that going to add to the valuation of being on two different channels? We have our direct-to-consumer side that's working really well, but now we have an additional platform that if it was going to be used, um, we've already done the legwork for that, or maybe we've got an IP, or we've got legal setup associated with it. So there's multiple factors that go into that stuff, but it's pretty interesting when you get to that journey. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question, and I have an amazing team member that takes care of all the logistics, so I don't really think about that too much. Um, but we do have those leeway times and those negotiations. She's phenomenal um, at what she's been able to do and negotiate those rates for, especially because we've communicated with our suppliers, like our progression model and how we're wanting to do things. It's um, 
given them more confidence because we do send them a lot of business with different products and stuff. Um, so we do have some favorable rates associated with that, but we've made some great connections even with the people here at Powerhouse for different uh, 3PLs and stuff. But once the brand gets to you know these levels here, that's where we take that inventory, make it here in the States, 3PL, so like have the uh, companies that you know have scaled e-commerce brands or work with e-commerce brands to $10 million a year, um, different needs, and they may have loss leaders or they may have uh, you know in our portfolio a loss leader uh, brand versus you know one that they're making a lot of profit on and so that's the second tier of logistics that we use just to uh, build the foundation and then move it and get it into a more uh, I don't want to say an upgraded facility or upgraded service but it's it's more premium for sure um, so then that 500k to or to finish off the 250 to 500k that's where influencer marketing and collaborations are key. You start doing podcasts and you start doing some big campaigns that you know are almost similar to Coca-Cola where they're just throwing something just hopefully it sticks or just have some awareness. Um, and so that's why we try and emulate some of that as we get to these different levels uh, with our, you know, our uh, allocated budgets for it because um, it is important to have awareness and it's not just impression-based marketing. And we'll continue to talk about brand uh, and performance and direct response marketing here shortly. But that 500K to a million dollars is uh, per month. Uh, that's when people can start leveraging media and different retail distribution. Um, you know, there's some massive companies out there that once they've hit that on one channel, they definitely want to just diversify off of e-commerce completely if they started there because it is that advertising loop, that content loop, and it just repeats the cycle over and over and over. So instead of just being an e-commerce business, you can then transcend and be a little bit more of a uh, wholesale or a retail business and open up those, if you zoom out completely, channels for the product to actually move. And it does have a little bit more to do with the logistics and the lead time and what are the rates and things like that and consignment. So again, influence is key. And then to maintain and consistently have you know, your content on social, there's a lot of great speakers that talked on that earlier today. Uh, but UGC, whitelisting, uh, you may see companies like Fabletics that are just doing that right now. I know all the men in the room, you've probably seen the same ads that I have, um, but they are crushing it and they just have so much distribution that's wide. And so when Max and when, uh, uh, when Dan were talking about the different iterations that happen, that's when they're really at mass scale with the outputs and really doing that hyper testing with uh, the lead times in TikTok and even Facebook, et cetera. Cool. So um, this is how it's somewhat color coordinated on how that that marketing model works with uh, the financial model. Um, so direct response in the very, very beginning, again, establishing that offer, having someone actually convert and start getting that feedback, um, just that, that even that dopamine hit of like, hey, purchases came in from this offer, now let's go ahead and continue to work on it. As you kind of go higher and higher and higher, performance is a blend between brand and direct response. And so that's where you really want to start introducing brand, which is why investing into content and things like that are important from 30K plus. Um, now, obviously, you make the investments based off of where your senior cash flows are going, but that's where performance really becomes uh, hyper targeted. And that's where, you know, when we were at agency prior, these are where our clients were landing. We we're performance marketers. Not only were we helping them with uh, advertising campaigns on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, but what else can we do to establish brand? Like, are we creating great content to give them good reputation, PR? What other services can we add or layer into the brand to make it legitimate? And then you start getting into the, the money that doesn't even necessarily need every single penny to work with an ROI. It's just part of the whole machine where you're throwing money like a Coca-Cola ad and stuff like that to have some awareness of top of funnel. So um, to break it down a little bit more, this is really what I covered. And you guys, again, are going to get the slides. But the 30K uh, per month is using UGC to craft that uh, angle. So here are some things that you know, we see for that 0 to 30K, what we look for. Dialing in that website or landing page conversion rate to be anywhere between 3 to 7%. Because if you're in it for the long run, um, maybe you're not making as much profit on the front end. Uh, but you now are getting your data. And your first 100 to 300 customers is always the hardest because you're figuring it out. You're trying to get the right offer dialed in. Um, and then that's where you can start testing, adding different upsells to increase the average order value. We always say that there's three metrics that we look at to make an e-commerce brand either you know, a, a winner or we just pull it. It's the cost per acquisition, it's the average order value, and the lifetime value. We already know the cost per acquisition is going to be a fixed cost, and between 15 to, let's call it, you know, 40 bucks, right? Average order value better range in between 40 to about 200 and then lifetime value is it something that can be repeatable and if it's not then we better make that AOV go higher and how can we do that that's probably going to be with the upsells 
So that's how we look at that first 30K per month and validate the offer. You guys probably already know drop shipping. For those that don't, you don't buy inventory first, you sell it and then you basically ship it out. Uh, 30 to 80K per month, uh, investments into email, SMS, content, capital lines, we talked about that. And this was just to pull it off of those slides so you guys can take a look a little bit more. Now, the 250 to 500K um, per month, the two KPIs that they focus on are really the CAC and the LTV. I remember when we were working with companies like Onnit um, or Goalie Gummies, they're then able to increase their CAC or their customer acquisition or CPA because they know that they're gonna make money on the back end. And so that's where you see if I'm selling a $20 product or a $30 product, they'll be willing to spend 70 or 80 bucks because they know the upsells and the lifetime value will actually start to kick in. And so that's why I was saying that the lifetime value model, most businesses then start to shift around that. Um, and that's where you even see coaches and influencers, they'll start giving away things for free because they know that they'll upsell things down the road. And so this applies to that model as well. Um, and then you can even do t traditional uh, media, you know, like TV and things like that as well, um, depending on how big that your company gets. Now, as a frame of reference, it's always a mix between these two. They're always competing against each other. Like there's no right or wrong answer. The data is going to tell you and the money's going to come in and that's how you're going to make your decisions. So it's always an upwards pressure and a downwards pressure on these two. Um, and that's where you see the blend of performance. And then if you're an agency working with a client, then you definitely know what that means with performance and pressure uh, associated with that. So uh, I want to open it up for questions. This is some of the uh, results that we've been able to get based off of doing it. Um, and that's what we do. We set up Shopify stores, we scale them out, and we help them win. So if you guys just want to follow me on Instagram, that's my only call to action. Um, if you want to just check out our website, it's kind of cool. It looks nice. But I'm here to answer any questions for you guys. For product logistics? Um, yeah, man, I mean, you either bring in the talent by posting a, a job listing. Uh, we actually had this person work with us through many different uh, brands that we had done. Uh, I know you had worked with us for quite a while. We had uh, uh, f uh, one of our e-commerce brands that sold CMOS, one of our e-commerce brands that did skincare. Um, we actually were just using her to just check it out and reverse engineer it. And so she's just a virtual assistant. Uh, I don't wanna say just, but she, she's a virtual assistant that handles a lot of that stuff. She's an all-star. Um, but you can do Indeed, uh, you can do LinkedIn as well. Um, some of the companies that we have connections with, like Sourceify um, or uh, Titan 3PL, those are companies that you can uh, use like LinkedIn job descriptions and kind of pull from what they even source uh, to then start using it for yourself or hit those companies up and see if there's any help that they need. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah. Uh, that's based off our marketing team. Marketing team has more of a pulse on that. And so if we do need to, because uh, there's two parts to that. There's how much capital for operating the stores they're available in order to have leeway time. Uh, we want to stick to drop shipping as much as possible. It doesn't mean that we won't have inventory in the States, um, but we do sometimes do like smaller orders in the beginning to start those relationships with that particular product to make sure that the supplier knows that we're serious. And then when we do say, hey, we're going to go ahead and purchase three months ahead of inventory, they're like, all right, cool. You've already bought small orders. I'm talking like 80 bucks, 250. Sure, it may take a month for it to get here into the States and put into the three PLs. But if you just establish that a little bit earlier on, um, they'll be able to move when you need them to move. Yeah. She's great at the role because she understands the marketing side. She's not just so logistics heavy. So she's pretty integrated and, and connected to the customer service side. And I think that's pretty important because that's also product quality. It's not just, hey, can we get inventory? It's, it, are the products that we're receiving good? Are they you know, actually up to par? So she is pretty connected with the customer service team um, and how you know, they're basically getting the feedback from the customer on what's, what's going on with the product. Uh, but the qualities, I mean, she's a self-starter. She's problem solving. Whenever uh, we have a team presentation, she brings PowerPoints and presentations going over what the issues are around that specific area versus us having trying to figure it out. And so that's just an extended brain uh, for, for us to not have to think about it. But uh, I mean, outside of that, man, she's, I think just being with us for a long period of time, she's been able to groove in and it actually interested her. Um, and so just having someone that understands the marketing side, because that's where she started out. She was with us for about three years. 
really just on the order fulfillment, like a simple virtual assistant uh, that's only doing just order fulfillment with drop shipping can then bridge into that. And so if you're looking to farm someone up and train them into that, that's the individual I would find first because they understand supplier softwares and they understand the back end of Shopify. It could grow into something in the future, but if you look at the listings for job descriptions other, under that, that's the foundation of what they need in order to start having those conversations. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. And Um, yeah, so it's that zero to 30K, you're validating the offer, still doing drop shipping. We even have companies that were still doing drop shipping 30 to 80K. Now, not every product, and this is where you, you don't want to just do it the first month that you hit 30 or the first month that you hit 80K. Um, you want to see is that supply chain associated with that product actually viable? What's the leeway time for that? It's not like you can go from 80K to 250K still doing drop shipping in most, in most cases. Um, you want to just see what the leeway time is so that way you can continue to optimize and have the cash flow between 30 to 80 and then save up that capital, invest in the inventory, let's say it takes two months to get there into the warehouse and stuff, then you can actually go to the next phase of ramping it up. And uh, one of our stores was actually at that 30, uh, then we scaled them up to 80, then 90K, then the following month we had to bring it down to 50, and then 50 because there was a two month leeway for the inventory. When we got it, we then did 216K in a month, just like that with the creatives and the content that we had, but we had to wait for the logistics and inventory to get there. softens the blow on the customer side or just like um, it depends on the product I mean some we give them like an ebook or some sort of digital product to give them an instant hit and then maybe two weeks three weeks later it comes but it just depends on the product some products you can do that with some you can't cool awesome